from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Joan Nathan, journalist and award-winning author of numerous books on cookery. Joan hails from Providence, Rhode Island, and is a graduate of the University of Michigan with a master's degree in French literature, and from Harvard University with a master's in public administration. Joan is best known as the doyen of Jewish American food. She is the author of the much honored Jewish Cooking in America, which in 1994 won both the prestigious James Beard Award and the International Association of Culinary Professionals Julia Child Cookbook of the Year Award, as well as many other books on Jewish cooking, including The Jewish Holiday Kitchen, The Flavor of Jerusalem, and The Foods of Israel Today. These and other books are included in this display in the back of the room. She is also a television personality. Her PBS television series, Jewish Cooking in America with Joan Nathan, was nominated in 2000 for the James Beard Award for Best National Television Food Show. She was senior producer of Passover, Traditions of Freedom, an award-winning documentary sponsored by Maryland Public Television, and she has appeared as a guest on numerous radio and television programs, including the Today Show, Good Morning America, Live with Regis and Kathy Lee, and NPR. Joan has received many honors and awards, including being a recipient of the Silver Spoon Award from Food Arts Magazine, and being inducted into the James Beard Foundation's Who's Who in American Food and Beverage. In the last several years, Ms. Nathan has expanded her interest from the history of Jewish food to the history of American food. She was the guest curator of Food Culture USA at the Smithsonian Folk Fe Folklife Festival in the National Mall in 2005, the same year of the publication of her latest book, The New American Cooking, which I just happen to have here. This book won the James Beard and IACP awards as the best American cookbook of 2005 and is the subject of today's talk. It is also for sale outside this room, and Ms. Nathan has graciously agreed to sign your copies following the program. I got a copy of this wonderful book a few days ago, and I'm intrigued, and I'm greatly intrigued by the great variety of recipes, from Appalachian griddle cornbread to Haitian soup jaune with butternut squash, beef, and cabbage, to Tunisian American fish couscous with striped bass and flounder. I hope you haven't eaten lunch yet. <laughs> In the introduction to the New American Cooking, Joan says, quote, until now I have written mostly about Jewish food, a tale of amazing evolution and adaptation both in this country and in Israel, but I have always been interested in the larger picture of how other ethnicities have affected America and the way we eat. With myriad immigrant groups, we are living now in one of the most exciting periods in the history of American food. For those who cook at home, there is an almost endless array of ingredients and spices from which to choose. Those who eat out in ethnic and upscale restaurants have a wide variety of delicious dishes that were unavailable a decade ago. According to the Library of Congress, in the past 30 years, there have been more than 3,000 American cookbooks published, more than the number published in the previous two centuries combined. The world's food is now literally at our fingertips. And now, to learn more about this wonderful array of foods, it is my honor to introduce Joan Nathan. Joan. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everybody. This is a very nice turnout. Um, I'm honored to be here today for, on, many, for many, on many levels. Um, first of all, whenever I write my articles, is Peggy Perlstein here? I guess she's not here, but whenever I write my articles for the New York Times, I check with her and I call her my secret ingredient. Um, she's just been fabulous through the years and, and I, for each of my books, I've done lots of research at the library and it's just, it's wonderful, it's just fabulous. And I was very touched by the display of books outside. Um, well, first of all, I just wanted to show you this book, and it just shows what's happening, unfortunately, to publishing today. When Random House was sold to Bertelsmann's, this book, which you know has gotten lots of accolades and has been certainly well received, and I've been happy I was able to 
buy, get the down payment of my house in Martha's Vineyard with my royalties. But when Bertelsmann bought Random House, they used my book as an example of unnecessary spending by having a beautiful hardbound cover. And I thought, oh. But I noticed in this book, it's equally as beautiful. I mean, not beautiful in a different way, but they certainly have not made it just an ordinary cover. So maybe Bertelsmann's is thinking, hmm, let's make this, let's make our books okay, which of course, you know, Random House, Knopf, Clarkson Potter, I forget the others, there are a lot of different ones under the rubric of Bertelsmann's publishing. But I was very upset when I learned that, that they just thought unnecessary spending you know, books are books, and there's something wonderful about the feel of a good book. And I know Bill was saying he likes the little head notes for my book. Well, I, head notes for cookbooks take a lot of work to make them good. You have to do a lot of research because they're, it's big, but you want to make them smaller. I had to cut this book um, down by a, about a third. Um, so, you know, that was pretty hard. Um, I, I, what I'd like to do is talk to you about American cooking today, and I think I'll start by telling you last night I had to give a, I didn't have to give, but I gave a book party for a young journalist who just wrote a book called Prisoners. Uh, he writes for the New Yorker, Jeffrey Goldberg, and it's about the Middle East conflict, really. So I thought, oh good, I'll make food from the Middle East conflict. So I looked at my cookbooks, and, um, and I, he said to me there were going to be about 80 people, which I thought, oh my god. Anyway, so I made what I, and I realized that the conflicting food is also the comfort food. So I made several recipes that were from my new book, one which is called Mahamar, and it's a Syrian red pepper and nut dip with um, pomegranate, uh, uh, what do you call it, pomegranate syrup and pomegranates and with fresh mint and it looks really pretty and I thought I only wanted to have finger food at this party because I didn't want to have to deal with plates so I thought okay we'll put them on pizza chips because this is the Middle East so I, ha I put the, this mahamar which is in the book and was everybody's favorite very easy put it on pizza chips that was one thing then I thought well I have to have falafel but maybe I should have Egyptian falafel because I wanted it this was Syrian mahamar Egyptian falafel, which I got from my, my Israeli cookbook, but I decided to use fava beans because it was Egyptian. And that, we, we, we got mini pita from Mediterranean Bakery. Do you know that place? And uh, if you don't know it, go there. And I cut them in half, so I had little tiny pockets. And I cut up the tomatoes and cucumbers, and I had tahina sauce, and then I had uh, um, Yemenite schug, which is a very hot sauce. And I was shocked because one person took a he heaping tablespoon on his little pizza bread, and he was in heaven. And I thought, oh my god. And then, then one of my favorite chicken dishes in the whole world is uh, a Palestinian dish called moussacha. And have any of you ever had that? It is just divine if it's done the right way. And I learned to make it from a Jordanian who I met at the Harvard, at the um, Kennedy School at Harvard when I was studying there. And my husband said, well, you should meet him because he was Minister of Information. I said, how can I meet a Minister of Information from Jordan? So I went up to, we were in a small class, and I introduced myself, and I said, you know, I really would love to learn to make musachan. Do you know anyone who makes it? And he said, well, I make it. He said, invite me to your house, and I'll show you how to make it. So I knew it was authentic. And last night, there were all these um, bureau chiefs from the New York Times and other places who'd lived in Jerusalem and knew and loved musachan as much as I did. It's got lots of sautéed onions and pine nuts and toasted pine nuts and then chicken with, with sumac, which is the, it's like a lemony flavor. It's just a delicious spice. And usually, you, you cook it in the oven on a big flat bread. But again, I wanted finger food. So I stuffed it in these little pizzas, the, the same thing I did with the falafel. Anyway, and then I did hummus with preserved lemon from the New American Cooking. I had the mahamar from there. Um, oh, then I wanted to do stuffed grape leaves. And I thought, hmm, well, Armenians right now are not in conflict, but they've had conflict. And the best stuffed grape leaf recipe in the world is Armenian. So I did that. And, and I had some other, it, it was really a great party. And it required a lot of work beforehand, but I enjoyed the party, which 
I don't always enjoy the party because I'm thinking about what has to be done. Anyway, but these were all from my books. And I, well, this, this morning when we were sort of eating leftovers for breakfast, I was thinking that, oh, and the, oh I know another thing I did was Iranian, I had, to have, it's, I, I had um, Iraqi eggplant um, dip, and then I had Iranian um, sweet and sour um, meatballs. But that was, do any of you know Fessenjan? It's a wonderful walnut and pomegranate stew with chicken usually, or duck actually. It's in my New American Cooking. And what I did was I made meatballs. So I'd have the sweet and sour meatballs, but with this pomegranate flavor. It was really delicious. So there are all these people poking you know, their spears into the, um, to the meatballs. Anyway, enough said about that. But I, what I'd like to do is talk to you about the New American Cooking. And Cliff Wharton is a perfect example. I know he's shy back there. But he, he is the chef at Ten Pen. He is from a Philippine-American Philippine background, right? And um, this dish is just so typical of what's the, the, the soup, of what the New American ingredients are. Because there's coconut milk in it. Think about, and I'm going to ask you for some more thoughts of this. Ingredients that we didn't know 30 years ago, okay? Coconut milk, galanga, most people don't even know what it is. It's, it's of the ginger root family, doesn't taste like ginger root, right? I s always say you can use ginger root instead if you can't find it, because I like ginger root, but it's, it's a little different flavor. Maybe he can tell us about it. Lemongrass, who was, now you can, it's grown here. Who was, uh, you know, I, I, uh, some of you Asian immigrants, my guess is when you first came here, you couldn't find any of this at all. And I'd love to have, you know, some uh, talk afterwards, because it's such, I can see it's a good group. Kaffir lime, lime leaves, you know. Um, lime juice, fish sauce. The only fish sauce that we knew, because it's got the same component, and I, and I see it was disguised, was Worcestershire sauce. It has anchovies, but fish sauce, look at how many kinds of fish sauce there are in Asian supermarkets, but more important, at, at the mainstream American supermarkets, of course, the flavor is not as intense as, you know, all of the, if you go to Whole Foods, which I like Whole Foods, but I, I would never buy my Asian or my Latino products there. I'd go to an Asian or Latino store where it's not going to be watered down for Americans. Anyway, uh, sugar and chives, that's the rest of it. And then, of course, chicken adebo, which is something that he knew from his, is it your mother or your father's side of the family? Yeah. His mom's side. So it, th these are dishes that Cliff told me about. At We, we had breakfast at, f what's it called, Funky? Fuki. And, you know, he taught me about his family's culture, and I thought, perfect. He's perfect for my book, because now th th his culture might have been something that was hidden 30 years ago. He might not have talked about it so much. Now we're celebrating these, the diversity. Um, and then the other, the, the other two um, recipes, one is focaccia. The focaccia in my book, which is Mark's, has onions on it, sautéed onions, but they just gave us the focaccia. Who was even thinking of focaccia 30 years ago? Who was thinking of good bread 30 years ago? And then, of course, Ann Amernick's cookies, these are like perfect. I think she g gave us the chocolate chip cookies. But she, again, is a, a really good chef who has perfected recipes. And um, what I'd like to do now is sort of to talk, I'd, I'd like to know some other ingredients that you knew about that we didn't have 30 years ago, or, or dishes. What are some of the ones that were not American 30 years ago? Because that's what this book is all about. It's about the innovators, the innovations, the story of the change, and great, I think, great recipes, because I love cooking from this book. So any, any ingredients that you know of besides uh, ginger root even was one, yeah? Cilantro. Cilantro. I mean, that's a perfect example. You know, uh, again, you can get a, a I, I go to the, the Latino markets for really good cilantro, but who was eating cilantro? Who even liked cilantro 30 years ago? What else? Yes? Well, you can both. What? Thai basil. I, one of the people that I interviewed in the book, um, Nan Grand Docks, who lives out in Chantilly, she has a wonderful restaurant, and I always forget if it's basil Thai or Thai basil. She said that she missed Thai basil so much, and, and she was married to an American, and she was walking near the, um, the Thai embassy, 
in Washington, and she saw some Thai basil, so she stole it <laughs> and then started. Now, of course, she can get it here. What's the other ingredient? Right, well, right, but look at not just rice noodles, look at all the different kinds of noodles, and also the masa harina. I, you know, I talk about these Asian markets, that, or they're Asian owned, but they're Hispanic Asian markets. Grand supermarket, I think, in, uh, where Duke, is it Duke Street in Alexandria? And they, I know they have a lot um, in, in other parts. There's one right in Adams Morgan. What they have is, uh, I call them equatorial supermarkets where they have all these like mango, um, I don't know, avocados, much less expensive than mainstream supermarkets. But they also have masa harina and they have all the Asian noodles. So they have the same kinds of um, produce that everybody wants, but then they have the, the products that, that people need um, from America. I mean, from their country, and very often they're made in America too. But rice noodles, all kinds of soba noodles, they're all... Okay, any other? Yes. Absolutely, the different kinds of peppers. And um, also the strength, I think some of this, they, they've toned down a lot of the strength of them. But who thought of hot peppers the way we have them? Who even liked hot peppers? You know, they're more salsa sold than ketchup now in Heinz, which is, I still like ketchup, but anyway, I'm, I'm a, a, a closet ketchup lover. Okay, <laughs> yes. Right, Christophine's, well, there are all kinds of ugly fruit. That's true, I like that, ugly fruit. But there are, and, they, and some, you know, I sometimes wonder, we've discovered so many things. What can be new? I mean, I, I was just at the uh, Saloni del Gusti from Slow Foods in Italy, and I saw all these unusual tomatoes that somebody had just given me some um, heirloom varieties that had, you know, tomatoes that are shaped like peppers, and f I forget what they're called, but fabulous. That's going to be the next trend. There was one other person. Yes. It, right. Well, the, we had we had big eggplant, but we didn't have all of the Asian eggplant. Mm -hmm. And the, right, and the round, the Brazilian ones, the green ones. I mean, uh, uh, absolutely. But you haven't gotten to the most obvious. What? Oh, well, that's one of the obvious. Mushrooms. Mushrooms were white. They were button ones or they were in cans, right? And then in the 80s, um, they realized that they wanted to expand the mushroom business. One, uh, and of course you know that it's, you know, Ken Square, there, there are Quakers and Italians in the mushroom business. Probably owned by the Quakers, run by the Italians. Um, and I, I know a few stories that are in the book. Um, there was a mushroom, uh, th this woman named Maria Forrest, I forget, uh, Maria, uh, I think her maiden name was Venturi or something, Forrest. She discovered a portobello mushroom, in, but she didn't call it that. She, a giant cremini mushroom when she was in, in Italy, and she thought this would be great to, to use in America. And so she went to all the different stores, and she showed, the, uh, to the, like supermarkets, and she showed people how to use it. And it really wasn't taking off. And then um, Philip's mushrooms, for some reason, got sent a, a crate of these portobellos and thought, these are, who's going to use these ugly looking mushrooms? And then th they gave them to some chefs who really liked them, and they were good in restaurants for people that were vegetarians. They had a, a, a meaty f flavor and, I mean, f texture. And so they, th the, what happened was people were tasting them in restaurants and asking where to get them. So then Philip started going um, uh, retail with them. And it's the same thing, by the way, with baby artichokes. Baby artichokes were all used in canning. And then chefs started using because they are full, they're not really baby artichokes, they're fully ripened, but they're smaller. And the chefs started using them and people wanted them, so now we can, we don't have them as much as the, 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 the mushrooms, the portobellos, and also all the organic mushrooms, um, except for one kind of mushroom you cannot produce inside, which is the morel. As one of the, uh, the, uh, one of the mushroom people said, only God can make a morel. But wild mushrooms, organic wild mushrooms. All right, the, what? Tofu. Well, tofu is another example in the book. This guy, were, were any of you at the Folklife Festival when we did Food Culture USA? 
because there we had a whole tofu section. You could learn how to make tofu. A guy named Steve Demos, who was a vegetarian living in Boulder, Colorado. There were a lot of all these guys that were vegetarian. You know, they were against the war in Vietnam in the 60s. And they, anyway, he, so he was, he um, brought his milk to make tofu, the soy milk, to the farmer's market. And it was very successful. People liked it. And he just sold it to Dean Foods. It was silk soy. So for $120 million. So he's no longer sort of a you know, counterculture person. And then another guy named Mike, uh, Michael Cohen had, temp uh, what's it called, tempeh. And he did the same thing. He, I went to visit him in New England, and he had all these Buddhas around, you know, and he, he it still goes to his local co-op in Greenfield, Massachusetts. There were certain pockets in America where a lot of this turmoil was brooding about the Vietnam War, but also a lot of um, cooking was going on. So it was in Greenfield, Mass., Berkeley, a, a Michigan, Boulder, Colorado. You can see which the university towns. Anyway, um, Michael just sold his company, I can't believe it, to Conagra for another $120 million for Tempe Life Flight. And what, uh, the way he really made it big with, with Tempe was um, he went to the University of, Cal of Massachusetts to some chemical flavor enhancers. And the flavor enhancers said, he said, look, we want to make our uh, Tempe taste like corned beef and taste like hot dogs, like smart dogs. And so they, they put the flavors in so that they would taste like that, and they just were wildly successful. So, but you've still, the, the, the two that I think are the most telling about our culture today is hummus, chickpeas, and basil, um, fresh basil. When I spoke to Roberta Dona, he said to me that when he came here in 79, he couldn't get any fresh basil, except in the Italian community. I mean, that is amazing. Um, but think about it. What made hummus and, and basil so popular in America? The Cuisinart. Because before the Cuisinart, you couldn't make pesto, and, be, and you couldn't make hummus. And Americans were too lazy to use a mortar and pestle. So that. Anyway, so this gives you an idea of, of some of the things that are in the book. But what I'd like to do, uh, I spoke for, I've spoken for a long time, for 15 minutes, just to give you an overview of the way I see things that have changed in America. Um, there are three basic changes that I see. First of all, in 1965, there was the um, Civil Rights Voting Act, which made us start looking at America differently. Um, instead of looking inward, we started looking at, well, we were looking inward because we realized that we had not given the black culture, Afro-American culture, the, 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 the rights that they deserved. And as we were looking at that culture, we started looking at other cultures. And we realized the same, we started looking out. And, you know, the Smithsonian made big changes that, at that period, and so did America. The 1965 Civil Rights Voting Act was, I mean, this, excuse me, 1965 Immigration Act came into being at that time. And as Calvin Trilling said, that for those people who like to eat, this was our Emancipation Proclamation. Um, because the, the, the food, with all these new immigrants, became better. Before 65, um, there were about 50% of immigrants, no, 80% of immigrants were places from Central and Eastern Europe. Europe. After 65, and maybe there's some statistician here who knows better than I do, but anyway, 50% um, were from, Asia, uh, from uh, South America, and of that 50%, 50% were from Mexico, and the rest were from countries that we really hadn't heard of, Afghanistan, um, Thailand, the Philippines, um, a lot of African cultures, and with them they brought great food. In addition, um, Americans started to get more adventuresome about f going abroad. So they were tasting things like, um, oh, well, th they, they were going, uh, the, the, the uh, what do you call it? Pan Am's Fly, uh, Fly Now, Pay Later came into being in 1963, I believe. Uh, the credit cards came into being. So the people could travel abroad. Um, then there was the Peace Corps. So people were tasting things, living abroad, bringing immigrants back, uh, bringing flavors back, 
and we had new immigrants. So at first, they, you know, th this was quiet immigration. Then on the other hand, we had, as I was saying, there were these counterculture people that were against the war in Vietnam, a lot of them, and they were in their communities cooking. Um, Alice Waters was one of them in California, and she was really concentrating on her restaurant and bringing in, like Laura Chanel, who's company just sold to a French company for um, goat cheese. She came and showed, she'd been experimenting making cheese. She had uh, some goats and she showed it to Alice and Alice said, oh my God, this is so fabulous. So she bought everything that she had for her restaurant. And people were coming, not just to Alice Waters, they were coming to people a little bit later, Patrick O'Connell, different farmers were, were bringing things to him. In Vermont, people were bringing things to people. And so it was going on very quietly around the country. But then, and I think it was 1973, um, a guy named John Mackey uh, was in Austin, Texas, one of 25 co-ops. And his father gave him uh, a little extra money to make his food co-op go above the others. And of course, it's Whole Foods, which is now a Fortune 500 company. And there are not just one, but there are a few more. For I think Wegmans is another one. And uh, it's supposed to be the best company to work for uh, somebody's from Rochester nearby um, in America today. And, and, and that, you know, if you go to that store, it, I mean, you all know Whole Foods, well, you know Wegmans too f if you go into Virginia, but they, they were having farmers, uh, um, d you know, depending on the seasons, bringing in foods forever at, that, at their stores in, um, in Rochester. And I, I was there recently and had dinner with Danny Wegman, and I thought that he has like a showcase fish restaurant next to the, and it was so fabulous that I thought, this is in Rochester, New York. It's pretty unbelievable. But, you know, there, there, there are now supermarket chains that really are l listening to people. Unfortunately, in the Washington area, I think we've totally missed the beat. I think that a Safeway and Giant, I don't know what they have, they had a chance early on and they, I hope there's no one from those families or something here. <laughs> anyway, okay, so that's one thing that is certainly, and, and it's even growing. I'm involved with something right now where they're taking heirloom tomatoes and they're trying to make them um, year-round in the, in the Washington area um, using absolutely sustainable techniques. And there are all these farmers that are going to learn things all over the world. I mean, it is pretty amazing what's going on all over the country. Okay, so that's the second thing, is the sustainability that we're really concerned with. And look at the number of farmers markets that grew from 300, 1970, to over 4,000 today. That's a pretty big increase. The third, of course, is the rise of the chef. And um, this started, I believe, with Julia Child. By the way, I have a new assistant who's like, 19 years old, you know, comes to me every, one, every few days just to do some work. And she never heard of Julia Child, and I realized none of them have. I mean, that's just, you know, these kids, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I said, well, go look it up, she still didn't look it up. <laughs> maybe I should just tell her she can Google, you know, she doesn't have to look in a book. Anyway, um, I think that what really changed was when Julia started, remember her French Chef cookbook? I mean, and then her French Chef TV series. Um, that sparked the American public, and everybody loved it. I remember I was doing some research in the late 70s, um, and I was in the bayous of, of Louisiana with some fishermen, and they were all, they had to stop talking to me to watch Julia on television. Um, <laughs> But Julia, if you remember it later, she had something called Julia Child and Friends. And th these young friends were Emeril Lagasse and Wolfgang Puck. And then at the same time, Food Network started. And Food Network at the beginning, nobody thought it would continue. It was just awful. But somehow it did. It got a new injection of blood or something. And, uh, you know, it's taken off. And all of these people had shows. Now, of course, they don't even have food people on the shows. They just need good entertainers to do food. But that's, but, but that there was something else, and, and I'm sure Cliff would attest to this. In 1973, or 76, the American Federation of Chefs um, started, they, they had been lobbying for a long time to make the, the title of chef in the Department of Labor 
a white collar worker as opposed to a blue collar worker. And um, so it changed in 1976. They, they, they got that assignation. And I think that, that, that chefs felt better about themselves and we look up to them more than we did. And I think that that had a lot to do with it as well. I mean, now they're superstars, you know. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I know I have lots of friends whose children want to be chefs today. That's okay, but it wasn't 20 years ago, believe me. All the, the cookbook writers that I know who left academia th to, to write cookbooks, their parents were just appalled that they would do something. And by the way, cookbook writers, serious cookbook writers, in the early 70s or late 70s were somebody, were respected and their books sold very, very well. Now, of course, you know, it's the Paula Deans and the Rachel Ray's, that's whose book, it's just unbelievable the change that that has taken a, a lot because of the internet. Um, and that said, that what I tried to do in my book is show the stories of people that have made a change. I, I was really interested in, uh, I, I like stories, and I like stories about people. So I'll just tell you two of them that I thought were pretty great fun. One was a guy named Ed Ledoux from California. And I'd heard about him. What happens is people, when I'm starting to write a book, I put files down, southwest, southeast, north, wherever, and then I fill them with ideas that people have given me so that when I go out to, to go to a part of a country, I know who I'm headed for. You know, I knew, for example, that my editor wanted me to go to the Hmong in Minneapolis. And I had always wanted to go um, to the wild rice harvest in northern Minnesota. So I sort of combined them. But this one guy, Ed Ledoux, a lot, several people tell me about it. They said he's an unsung hero, and I love unsung heroes. And Ed was the person who invented California pizza. And he was working, he was just a guy from Arkansas or Alabama or someplace. He was working in um, northern California making good pizza. In those days, they had like a pizza topping line and a pasta topping line. And he got sort of bored with, you know, the anchovies and the regular stuff with the topping of pizzas. So he took things from the pasta topping. And they, they, they did have a um, wood-fired oven where he worked. And his pizzas became kind of well-known. And this young Austrian chef came to his restaurant, Wolfgang Puck, and he said, I'm opening a restaurant called Spago, which is, you know, we want to have sort of relaxed food, not the stuffy French food that I've been cooking. And how would you like to come and open the restaurant with me and make the pizzas? So he said, sure. And he went down there and he invented things like Jewish pizza, which draw, brought me there, which was creme fraiche, smoked salmon, and dill, which is a very good, oh, and then a little bit of caviar. Um, then, he, the, anyway, so he worked for him and then he got a little bit bored and he, he left and he opened a pizza joint in Studio City called Coyote Pizza Cafe. Then these two men, these lawyers from California, from the, um, uh, what do you call it, the uh, um, uh, California Pizza Kitchen guys came to him and said, listen, I want to open, an, we want to open a restaurant, a K California Pizza Kitchen. So he worked for them, got bored, and went back to his restaurant. Anyway, so he gave me, I've got to find a page, which I just, um, he gave me his recipe, and I'll just read this to you. Oh, here it is, okay. Um, for maternity salad. Uh, oh, let me, before I read that, let me just tell you about the other person, because then after I read that, I'll have questions, okay? The other person is a guy named Steve Harrell, who was also, I thought, an unsung hero. You know the mix-ins in ice cream? Well, he was the one who invented the mix-ins. And he had this r place called Steve's Ice Cream. I bet a lot of you knew it in Somerset, Mass. And, Somerville, excuse me, Somerville, Mass. And I, I, it, then two guys named Ben and Jerry came to see how he did his mix-ins. And he showed them how to do it. And they weren't very good at it. So they decided to pre-mix their mix-ins. And, of course, the rest is history. He, he quit... Um, uh, the ice cream business because he got burnt out and he went to Western Mass. He was going to be a homesteader and he missed ice cream. So he opened a place called Harold's because he had a non-compete clause in Northampton, Mass. So if you want his ice cream, you can go there. Anyway, but um, back to Ed Ledoux. I'll just read this to you and then we can have questions. Perhaps more important than California pizza is Ed Ledoux's Romaine and Watercress Salad. Also dubbed the maternity, labor, miracle, or pregnancy salad, 
It purportedly induces labor in overdue women. <laughs> About 50 women visit Coyote Pizza Cafe in Studio City each week to sign the pregnancy book and order the salad. The day I visited the restaurant, a very pregnant Patty Murphy had driven 70 miles from San Clemente to order a maternity salad to go. It seems that speculation about this simple watercress and remains salad studded with gorgonzola cheese and walnuts has gone national. The best and most expensive balsamic vinegars, which Ledoux uses, are produced in wooden barrels and aged for years. And according to scientists at the NIH, a fungus that grew, grows on grain can produce derivatives that cause the uterus to contract. Watercress is a blood purifier, and gorgonzola is a blue cheese that may have a chemical with the properties of oxytocin, the natural hormone in the woman's body that induces labor. Whatever its chemical properties, this salad certainly has the magic. We get six to 12 pregnant ladies a day, Ed told me. <laughs> the legend has been going on so long, there must be some merit to it. <laughs> Anyway, so that's um, the maternity cell, and I thank you. And I just want to say one thing. There's somebody, there's some, if any of you are interested in the culinary historians, um, somebody is here from there, and there's some brochures there. It's a great organization. It meets on Sundays in Bethesda and has very interesting speakers, and it doesn't cost very much to join. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.